Good morning. I hope you're having a blessed day today. The goodness of God is rich and real toward all of us, and I'm very, very thankful. I'm sure that you are, and I never want to take for granted the blessings. I never want to take for granted the goodness and the blessings of God toward us, and I'm sure you feel exactly the same way. If you have a great praise report from something that's happened in your life, uh, I think that for our kind of uh, Calvary Online, it would it would be good to share some of that. Some have asked prayer needs and raised and presented those. Uh, if there's been a good report, then please share that with us. I have several friends that are coming out of the coronavirus and are seeming to do well. I'm very, very thankful for that. I'm thankful that uh, our Beyond 350 project is moving forward quite well. Uh, we're still not quite at $350,000 toward our next building, but, um, but we're a long way further toward it than what we used to be. Very thankful for all those who have given not just at our local church, but from the Calvary Online crowd. If you'd like to sow a seed in our future, springfieldcalvary.church. Of course, when you visit Springfield, uh, we will want you to come and, and be part of our church wherever we end up. We want you to visit us and, and let us know that, look, I sowed some seed into you guys being where you're at and being able to do all that you're doing with home Bible studies and anger management classes and and uh, teaching on parenting and everything else. I'm excited about what the Lord's doing, and I'm excited about the people of God, and I am thrilled for those that are being reached with the, the gospel right now. This is an incredible time to be alive. It's as, as I told the church Sunday, uh, we won't we won't ever get to do things just like we're doing or told them Wednesday. We won't ever get to do things just like we're doing them now. Uh, a year from now, we'll be having to hug people and we'll be having to shake hands with folks. And, and, uh, and of course, I think we've all missed those kinds of things. But since we got this, let's have fun with it. Uh, let's, let's do our best to enjoy it and we can mully grub about it and Right, it's not going to help one bit, but uh, God's got it. It's going to be all right. Today, as we get into Acts, the second chapter, and we're going to be working specifically with verses 14 and 15 uh, today, and probably also at the first of next week. If you would today share, if you would tag somebody who uh, might benefit from this, I want to challenge you to tag. Uh, particularly or share via messenger with some younger preacher. And when I say a younger preacher, I'm particularly targeting those that are under 40. And I, I, I don't want to put something into their world that would be a negative, but I, I do want to share some things that I have learned about communication. So uh, there's several things involved with what we're doing here online and uh, I like your help with that. Make a comment, give us your praise report, uh, share a prayer need, uh, any of those good things. It's not far from my latest book, Bad Decisions, The Legacy of Lot, becoming a record breaker in the number of uh, pre-release sales, the one just before it broke the earlier record, so I'm thankful for that. Those who have read it uh, in a pre-release have indicated, or in a preview, have indicated this is the best of anything that I've written. It's, uh, it's uh, well, it's a good book. But what I'm asking for, I'm not suggesting you buy the book on my website. You can do that if you want to, but pray. And I want, I want you to pray that this book breaks outside the normal purchasers of the material that I've written. If, if it can, then it begins creating a platform of influence beyond those who 
are currently and or have been in the past influenced. So that's what I'm really wanting you to pray about. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing this but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I realize that as I present today that I'm actually backtracking from some of the things that I've talked about already because we've talked about his response to the drunken, uh, to the mockers who said they're drunk. We've talked about the fact that he was pretty succinct in his response. He didn't let that negative thing become what propelled him or drove him. But I want to back up, and we've talked about even him lifting his voice. I want to go back. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to the multitude, You men of Judea and all ye of Jerusalem, or dwell at Jerusalem. When you read what Peter said there, he did not begin with answering the mockery regarding these being filled with the Spirit as drunk. Nor did he start by preaching Jesus. He does not mention initially, although he quickly gets to it, the prophetic words of Jesus, of Joel, excuse me, and he is going to quickly get into the message regarding who Jesus was and his death, burial, and resurrection. Peter's first words to this group of people were, ye men of Judea. This was a fisherman who likely had not done a whole lot of public speaking in his life, but he is being inspired of the Holy Ghost for the genius of connecting to the people before him. Because when he said, you men of Judea, there is goodwill in those words. It expressed where he was at. Jerusalem was in the province of Judea. Whenever you read the word Judea in the New Testament, <clears throat> you can immediately mentally transition that to the word Judah in the Old Testament. And uh, you, you probably remember that during the time of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the, the nation of Israel was divided, and uh, Rehoboam was not very wise in the way that he dealt with taxation. And ten of the tribes uh, abandoned and left <clears throat> And they became what was known as the nation of Israel. Perhaps you've read of the ten lost tribes. Well, that's what that would be referring to. And I don't have any knowledge or information about the ten lost tribes. I'm just saying that's, that's what it's a reference to. The two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin, became the nation that was known as Judah. We tend, <coughs> excuse me, we tend, including me, to use the word Israel. <clears throat> and excuse me again, I'm sorry. But the nation of Judah was the more significant through the latter part of the Old Testament and in the time of Christ. Judah, contrasted to the nation of Israel, continued to be governed by the descendants of, of David. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah and Judea, and Jesus came from the nation of Judah, and he was born in, in Bethlehem of Judah or Judea. Okay, so we have a little picture. We'll talk about it more in just a moment because there's things here that are, that are significant having to do with communication. And I want to not just give um, dry this is information that is there, but I want to make it rep, uh, relevant and applicable. Peter, the fellow who is speaking, was a Galilean. Galilee was a totally different province from Judea. And actually the province of Samaria was between the two, except a tiny finger of land 
that uh, kind of went around the edge of Samaria, made it a long, long distance from from um, Jerusalem to say the Sea of uh, to the Lake, um, the Sea of Galilee. So most of the time, because people didn't like going through Samaria, they would make that long trek. So these were two different entities. Uh, Judea had been something of a problem child for the Roman government, so they had sent a governor from Rome who presided over everything that happened in in Judea. Um, you will remember the name Pilate. Well, he had been sent from Rome. There's nothing local about this particular man. Um, the province of Galilee, by contrast, was governed by King Herod Antipas, and he was uh, descended from earlier uh, Israelite kings. He was not descended from David. He was descended from earlier Israelite kings, and it was pretty well self-governing as long as things went well. Of course, Herod Antipas had to answer to Rome and pretty well any thing that he said. So the speaker said, ye men of Judea. What's, what's Peter doing with that? Well, he's building a bridge. He is connecting. He is letting his audience know where he was. He's in Jerusalem. There were people in town from other places. Their roots would have been in Judea because the nation of Israel had pretty well turned to the worship of other gods. So these are people of Judea. These are people that at least temporary are dwelling in Jerusalem. He knew who they were. He wanted his audience to know that he knew who they were. And this bridge building principle, it was important for what Peter was about to do. And let me just toss in this observation. The same principle is necessary for those who teach a home Bible study, who speak to a Sunday school class, for those who speak at uh, a youth event, speak at a local church, or preach at some great event. A bridge has to be built between the speaker and the audience. Well, there's a multitude gathered there that day. A multitude, the multitude, and really even two or three people cannot build a bridge. Instead, the speaker is responsible. Does that make sense? The speaker is responsible to build a bridge, and it connects. It creates common ground. And for some audiences, this is more important than it is for others. Well, this particular day, it was vital because these people from Judah, they lived on the basis of a promise of God. They were descended from Abraham. They had survived and endured in spite of so very many things that had happened. They had a, a very distinct identity. Everybody around them was polytheistic. They worshiped three gods or three expressions of God. They worshiped ten deities. They were all polytheistic in their perspective. Whereas the Jews of Judea we're continuing to stand firm on, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. They believed he was one. They believed his name was one. And the people of Judea felt themselves to be a cut above everybody else. Now, I'm not uh, speaking well of pride at all. As a matter of fact, it was pride and their pride over their lineage that got them in significant trouble. Uh, remember how Jesus indicted them by saying, uh, you're always talking about we have Abraham to our father, but then you don't even keep the basics of, of the law. Uh, he was saying to them, you're acting like that's something really significant, that you have Abraham to your father, but 
what about today? What about right now? So their being proud of their heritage and lineage was not something that really set well with the Lord. But these Jews, and that's the word that is used to speak of them, they are Jews, and when you speak of people who are Jewish today, uh, you're speaking of people who are of this, this province. They are of this nation of Judah. So every Hebrew is not a Jew, while every Jew is a Hebrew. Because of the large, great pool of people who would make up the Hebrew nation, ten tribes became this smaller nation, and two became Judea, which would be where the Jews have come from. So what are they so proud about? Number one, they, they were proud that God had given to them and to no other nation the law. Secondly, they were proud that their prophets spoke truth that had been fulfilled. And this was an important thing to them. And I don't know that they always practice what uh, they were instructed to do, but a false prophet was anyone who uh, missed a single prophecy. If they said something was going to happen and it didn't happen, they were considered false prophets and were to be put to death. So a prophet of Judah had to be careful in what he said, lest he put himself at risk. So they were, see, all of the other nations, all of them had prophets, all of them had people who would speak to life situations of the future of the nation. And in most instances, those prophets spoke of great things that were going to happen, wonderful things that were going to take place. It didn't always happen in Judah. They told it as it really was. The third thing, and this was probably the primary, is their worship of the one true living God in contrast to the worship of all of the other nations around them. Okay, so now we see a little bit about who it is that that Peter has in front of him that he's going to speak to. We have him, he's received the Holy Ghost. He's spoken in tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. He has been worshiping and praising, and out here in this group there are questions that are being asked, and there even comes the mocking. Peter stands up with the eleven, and he lifts his voice, and he says to this group, Mocking, asking questions, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. So his bridge is to say, I reckon that they hear his voice. He is Galilean. He's got that brogue of that part of the world. He is saying, I know who you are. I know what you've had in God. I know about your experiences with God. Now, what I'm really trying to get us to understand today is the importance of building bridges to those to whom we want to share the gospel. There are several things to be noticed here. Peter simply speaks as to their identity. He does not tear down, oh, you folks don't have anything, and, and you folks are no better than any other nation, and you're just a bunch of idolaters. In a little bit, he's going to indict them about the crucifixion of Christ. But at this juncture, all he does is build a positive bridge, and he establishes it on the basis of the common ground, we're all here in Jerusalem. I'm not a Jew, I'm a Galilean, but you folks are, and I know who you are. I recognize, I value the significance 
of Judea and Jerusalem. And that's part of building bridges to other people is that you recognize their value and their significance. I've never seen anybody come to God who came, first of all, having someone rail on them about some falsehood or some foolish practice that was in their life. Now, in preaching, sometimes the Holy Ghost can convict people of sin, and it can draw them, it can bring them, and that's a Holy Ghost thing. But I'm talking about just in a, in a conversation. So as I talk today, I'm not talking simply about preaching I'm, or teaching in front of an audience. I'm talking about what we do one-on-one. -on -one. So let's think about that. How do we build bridges to those that we teach a home Bible study? Well, number one, I think we engage them learning about who they are. Secondly, we engage them by telling them who we are. Okay, so, and in both of those, we share additional information. We're getting to know. There is a intermingling. There is the, not just the seed of the word that's going to be shared, but there is also the seed of the child of the kingdom that is going to be planted into this person's life. And all of that is important. Okay, the third thing that I try to, to do to build a bridge, I try to learn a bit about that person's level of knowledge regarding the scripture. Because how much they know is going to affect how I approach teaching. If the person is not particularly knowledgeable about the scripture, I will slow down. Okay, so we're building a bridge, and you, you know, most of the time you just can't ask that. You can't just ask the question, "What do you know about the Bible?" It has to be a little bit more subtle than that. But you learn some things about them. Uh, if if any refreshment of any kind is offered I take something if it's a cup of coffee or if it's a water or iced tea I because there again there is a bringing together there is a velcroing together in hospitality though they're the ones providing you the hospitality We're talking about building bridges okay fourth thing for my home Bible studies is that I make them very casual. I can't remember the last time that I went and taught a home Bible study wearing a necktie, um, sometimes just because of the circumstance of where I've come from or where i got to go next. I will have on a jacket. But a lot of times it's just like I am today, just shirt sleeves and walk in and, and spend time with them in the Scripture. I want it to be casual. I don't want to come across... And again, this is an issue for me. It may not be for others of you who will listen to this, but I don't want to come across as a stuffed shirt. I don't want, I don't want to be perceived, and this happens to clergy. People think that we don't live in the real world. Well, guess what? Um, my car needs brakes, and uh, we have to put fuel in it, and the grass needs more. You understand? I want us to get on common ground. If I see that they're interested in some particular thing that uh, is maybe a hobby or a collection, they have on a Kansas City Chiefs cap or a sweatshirt or T-shirt, I'm building a bridge, I'm building a bridge, I'm building a bridge. Well, just get on to the Scripture. Well, we'll get on to the Scripture in a little bit. But right now we're going to build a bridge of relationship. That's what Peter's doing with ye men of Judea. There have been times when in teaching a Bible study, and I can't remember this ever happening in the first lesson, but I can recall some occasions when uh, after or during our 
opening conversation or discussion, it became clear to me through the Holy Ghost that this person was in something of a stressed situation. So instead of moving on and teaching, we talked and then we prayed. And I tried to help them. You see, if you go on to the Word of God and the person is not ready to hear it, then you haven't got the seed of God's Word on good ground. All right? So building a bridge. The last thing I'll mention that, that I think really helps me in building a bridge and teaching these studies and also when I am teaching at church is that I try not to do the Bible reading. I ask my students in that setting, are you willing to read the scripture? If you're willing to read the scripture, if it's just one person, we'll alternate. It's two or three or four people. I'll assign verses as the lesson begins and when it comes time for that verse to be read. Does it slow things down? Sometimes on occasion. Of course, many people now are using an iPad or they're using a phone or, or something for their scripture. So uh, that kind of facilitates finding the scripture. But a lot of times we just slow down. Why do that? Because I won't... I want the person I'm talking to to begin to cross the bridge to. I'd like for us to meet in the middle. I, I, I want us to find all of the common ground that we can. So I want their involvement and I want their participation. Now, let's think about how we build bridges when we preach or teach. First thing I'll say is this. Whenever you stand to preach, you better have something to say. And it needs to be said quickly. Ronald Reagan's speechwriter said, In today's society, the audience in front of you give you nine seconds to decide whether they're going to listen to you or not. In those nine seconds, they determine whether you have anything to say that is worth value. If they decide you don't, they go grocery shopping. They go ahead and plan next week's fishing trip. Have something to say immediately that is positive. Whenever you, anyone comes and preaches for us at Calvary, I'm much, I'm much more blessed and feel like they are connected with the audience. If instead of talking about Pastor Butler and I, they don't immediately say something meaningful that connects with that congregation. That is important. That's important. You also have to value the group in front of you. Uh, there are people who struggle if the congregation's too small. Well, I've always adopted the practice that God knows where he wants me. And if it's to preach to 15, then I'll preach to 15. I've never canceled anybody because a larger opportunity came along. How do I build with that audience? Well, number one is have something interesting to say. And then number two, be aware of where you are. Be aware of anything positive that can be said and then say it. Okay? You're building a bridge. You know where you are. You know who they are. And then you're able to get on into what you're doing. I hope this has made some sense. And I realize that uh, today has been a little bit different because I've taken a different tack. But when I read this and when I really gave consideration to it, I recognized that this this wasn't a waste of words that this is uh, this is the genius of connection this is where you start winning people is ye men of judea and all ye that dwell at jerusalem hearken to my words it begins with that have you ever seen somebody that just didn't connect unfortunately i have 
unfortunately, there have been a few times in preaching when the same thing happened. It just went poof, and I never did get the bridge bill. Was it effective? No, it wasn't effective. Build a bridge in your home Bible studies. Build a bridge in your uh, preaching and your teaching. When I teach, I almost always will have people in the audience who will do my scripture reading. Uh, and there's several reasons I do that. One is it gives a different voice, which tends to arouse additional attention. And then Secondly, it gives other people time, at least at times, it gives other people an opportunity to find that same text and dig into it a little bit. I love having different voices involved in what's going on as we get into the scripture. Again, I hope it's been helpful today. If you're in Springfield or close, Sunday. 10 o'clock. We're going to have a great day. Prayers at 930. If you join us for that, that'd be a good thing. We'd love to have you. The afternoon, 5 o'clock, we'll continue my series on the end of the age. Last week, as we talked about prophecy, it was compelling and uh, we had great response. Thank you for being here today. If you'd like to sow into springfieldcalvary.church, help us get over that $350,000 mark. God's good blessings on you, and uh, I will see you Sunday. And uh, for many of you who are in other parts of the world, I'll see you on Monday. God bless.